Uh, yeah, so thank you very much for inviting me to this meeting. It, it's, I enjoy it greatly, first of all, because I haven't been to Europe for all this like long, long two years, haven't seen people, haven't had any personal interactions. It like I feel like it will boost our activity because it has been kind of you know lasting, but then it started to be pretty boring last half a year without any broad discussions. Anyway, so uh, I would like to talk about uh, charge. So there was a lot of talks about what charge degree of freedom does in these materials, right? And we all know that there is also kind of all these electrons have spins, right? And we talk about it from the other side where we kind of have some couple of antiferromagnetic materials and we have this, all these beautiful spin liquid candidates. We're now even discussing if they're spin liquid candidates or not. Uh, and I would like uh, to try to probe and at least to narrow down how these two degrees of freedom are kind of basically kind of inter interplaying and uh, define each other. And uh, there were a lot of romantic ideas how we can get uh, kind of a different spin liquid from dipole uh, with a charge in uh, fluctuations, which I still hope we will see something like that. But so where to find it? Uh, and I would like to thank, yes, yeah, so all the agencies who support our work, which is DOE and NSF, and also a very large number of my collaborators. Uh, a lot of the ramen is done in my lab in Johns Hopkins, but there are a lot of crystal growers, which will be more, uh, Professor Kanoda, uh, also gave us some nice samples and I enjoyed the interactions with uh, uh, a lot of groups in the University of Tokyo when I was there in sabbatical. So, and we also have some very nice collaboration magla. Okay, so uh, I just reminding, yeah, so we have seen this already many times. So we have these two dimensional materials, right? And so what we have is uh, this, uh, layer is charged, right? So we have half electron per molecule, or if we have dimers, then we have one electron per molecule, and we also have this spin one half, right? And so uh, what uh, kind of, we will be talking about copper phases, and I will kind of go back a little bit to theta phases just to, because I want to have some overview uh, of uh, the very basic parameters which control this uh, properties. So for copper phases, where we actually would like to have this electrical dipoles, right? So uh, what, what do we have? So we have this copper phases, right? Where we have dimers of BDTTF molecules. So we have lattice sites, uh, which have one hole and a spin one half, right? And they can be uh, sitting on the, uh, on the triangular lattice, or they can be sitting on a uh, square lattice. And so uh, typically we have, we think about these uh, dimers as having an inversion center within them, right? So the orbital has an inversion center. And so uh, this arrangement actually allows us to uh, get a situation because of intrinsic dimerization. If we somehow manage to break an inversion center in the dimers, then we can have this small electric dipoles, which will be sitting on lighter side and then still will have spin one half. And so if we want to study how these magnetic interactions behave, magnetic properties behave, how we uh, want uh, to study how electric uh, dipoles behave, we want to have, of course, some bulk measurements. We also want to uh, probe uh, dipoles, so charge, and we want to probe uh, spin excitations, right? And it has been uh, like long problem in these materials that we haven't yet managed to do neutron scattering on uh, these magnetic systems. And if we would do, we would just say if those are spin liquids or not. So alternative uh, way to measure uh, magnetic excitations is uh, Raman spectroscopy, right? So we send uh, one component in and then we kind of, uh, we uh, have a two, uh, one photon and we have a two photon uh, process. We excite to a virtual say, we come back, right? So, and uh, this is something which we measure the 
light scattered in the system. And as an example, I show this picture from a review from Rudy Hakalot on Duvera, with who applied extensively Raman scattering spectroscopy to uh, our uh, cuprate uh, superconductors. And this shows how useful Raman scattering is. So we can probe electronic continuum if we have electron with uh, final lifetime. This we will not do in this talk. So we also, but we also have kind of importantly, we probe two magnon excitations. So we can probe uh, excitations of spin directly and we have phonons so we can probe lattice for molecular systems. We actually can probe local charge. So uh, two magnon excitations, again, I wanted to uh, remind uh, because it's not different, depending on the community, people know what I'm talking about or not. So if we have antiferromagnetically ordered chain, we will, for this exchange Raman scattering, we will exchange uh, two electrons. So we don't couple to spins. We are coupled to uh, electrons to charge excitations. So we will exchange uh, through optical transition, we'll exchange uh, electrons on two neighboring sides of these two sublattices without flipping spins. And so as a result, right, we break two uh, magnetic bonds, so we create two magnets. And our uh, restrictions are so the because photon has a very small momentum. So our these two magnons, we create pairs of magnons which have a, a momentum, sum of momentum equals zero. But of course, the energy is uh, two kind of the energy of these two magnons. And uh, so what we can kind of we should remember here that so if we have an ordered system. Uh, we really excite these collective excitations and we can calculate a spectrum just uh, basically if we have a spin wave spectrum, we can integrate over it over all pairs like that and get our to magnet excitation. But the process which I described is actually a local process. So we actually will probably also uh, kind of, if there is a short uh, correlation of uh, a range for magnetic interaction, well, for magnetic order, we still will see that. And that's why these two magnon band and Raman survived actually for materials we have a nil transition, they survive uh, to temperatures much higher than the transition. Uh, so this will allow us basically to probe if we have spins, spin one half in the system, right? So what kind of interpretation is model dependent? And it also will give us the idea what is the size of magnetic interactions. And we probably basically directly and not uh, through the fits of magnetic susceptibility. Okay, another tool is what we already talked about here uh, is vibrational modes of the BDT molecules, which are sensitive to charge. Right, so it, like this shows how we kind of can see the charge through the phase uh, order through the phase transition. And uh, so it is a local probe. So in principle, we just say that there is some charge order. We can look at symmetries uh, of our Raman scattering and have an idea if uh, it is uh, kind of, there is some long range order, but that's kind of, it's in principle, honest, if we are honest, it's a local probe, right? So, um, yeah, so we also, uh, we're trying to look what will happen, right? So first of all, disorder, right? Disorder broadens phonons. So if you have structural disorder, you broaden all the phonons and that would be an answer if we look at disorder. So if there is any charge dynamics, what would we see? So this is some um, modeling of uh, what will happen if we have two different lattice sites and then we can uh, have this dipole fluctuation that would our at least dream situation what we'd like to see in these materials. And we see that it's basically, I think it's uh, used uh, in NMR as motion broadening, right? So if we have species A, species B, we switch on the jumping between them. And uh, when the, uh, the frequency of jamming starts to be comparable with the uh, difference of frequencies between these two responses, then we start to see broadening of these bands. And then we eventually, if it's too fast, we'll see one band, right? And so this in principle can, uh, is one way to say that we have a uh, charge fluctuation in this system if we see a broadening of this band. 
band. We can only estimate uh, the exchange rate if we kind of have some idea where it should start with. Uh, right. And uh, so, of course, uh, broadening will be also could be a result of disorder. Uh, so, okay, so this is uh, how our Raman spectra look. We kind of, this is an example of this uh, antiferromagnetic uh, mod insulator where we see two magnum band, we see this charge sensitive band, we see some photoluminescence, which are actually comparably small to logarithmic scale. We see a lot of other things. So we see uh, molecular vibrations. So there is some disorder, everything should be broadened. We also see lattice vibrations. And it's actually, Mikhail, we should discuss because we looked at lattice vibrations at all these materials. And there are some things happening at this point where sitting like thinking how to apply the calculations to Jordan and Martin's group, which look at all these modes. Uh, uh, and there are many of them to uh, interpretation of our spectra. Uh, so, okay, so then just briefly what controls the ground state, right? So uh, there was a lot of uh, discussion now which uh, about quarter field systems, which uh, extended Hubbard model uh, describes them very well. There are a couple of people in the audience who did that all kind of more than 10 years ago, right? Uh, so. There's a checkerboard charge order, there are charge stripes, which actually in kind of already here, we start to think about spins because so charge stripes, actually some of these materials, my understanding show spin singlets, right? And so uh, there is a kind of like spin parse transition, which will make spin singlet and stripes, so it will be non magnetic So if we get intrinsic dimerization, so here, right? So we have uh, a quarter fill system. So here, if we have intrinsic dimerization as uh, happens in uh, copper phase, then we get to a mod insulator. And so kind of just intuitively what we were looking at before, there was no charge order, but we see these sites which uh, have one electron per dimer and we have uh, spin one half uh, and antiferromagnetic interactions. And what was nice that uh, when I started to do Raman scattering, I actually wanted to prove that we have this uh, spin one half there. At that point, there was a lot of discussion, maybe just like spin singlet and some kind of disorder on top. And we do see for these copper phase materials, we do see nicely uh, two magnon excitations. And this was the first example, which we used. This is uh, this uh, kind of well-known close to square lattice antiferromagnetic uh, mod insulator. And we have these two magnum band, which is actually were broad, much broader than uh, what people would see in high TCs or like in group rates, which at this point is still kind of not 100% clear to us why it's so broad. Uh, but we do see it and the J, uh, the magnetic interactions, which we estimated from this position, it was actually in a very good agreement with magnetization. So uh, magnetization, yeah, so sorry, magnetic fits of magnetic susceptibility. So, uh, yeah, so yes, uh, this is molecular systems and actually described by this model where we have a spin one half on this dimer lattice. And this is another material which we discuss so much here, which is this uh, spin, uh, spin liquid candidate, uh, where we also see uh, magnetic Raman scattering. So, when we Introduce frustration, uh, we ha would have uh, magnetic excitations with the same J shifted down to low frequencies, and we see it very nicely. So, they're kind of again, it's model dependent. So, people have calculated, like, kind of happy to discuss it afterwards, just cannot fit all this universe in this talk. Uh, so, uh, kind of uh, one can calculate it nicely what happens, uh, how magnetic interaction softens as you go into triangle lattice. There's also a nice calculation of uh, this particular material of uh, magnetic form factor from Ben Powell, which you look kind of, if you would uh, in integrate it, then you would see this continuum uh, starting at 600 phase numbers. So, it, uh -huh. so you see the yeah. So, but low, yes, yeah. but low frequencies are like uh, kind of miserably not low. So we will not see the gap. 
right? Especially kind of less than middle one. We will try to go to lower frequencies, but our limit is like gram scattering limit is 0 0.25 million. So, so there's a limit of frequency right, right. yeah yeah right right yes so but uh, no, you just it just basically flattens, so it's broadens and flattens, right? Because the position is defined by the geometry of uh, your antiferromagnetic system, and then kind of basically as you uh, kind of as your correlation length will decrease, you the band will broaden. Yeah. We, we we yes, we really want to go there. <laughs> so we have like for, because right so laser uh, in this the problem is this technique that we have laser heating and the signals are very low and so we are now building kind of a, a little bit different setup which will go to lower frequencies and and has a cryostat which can go to 1.5k and then I hope that we'll reach that state but it's a basically it's a separate experiment. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, for the okay, correct. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's why you have increasing noise, right? So, but because the phonons are, are, are similar in all these materials, right? It's basically molecular vibration. So, in this range, of molecular vibration. So, it's basically a kind of a standard procedure for all uh, similar structured materials. So it makes kind of it more, more confidence. So why, why is it what, sorry? Yeah. Ah, why is it so asymmetric? Yeah, so basically in uh, kind of, because you are integrating over the density of states of two magnons, and like, if you think about two magnets, so the so the primitive, so here we kind of, you have to look at the calculation for this particular structure, but very intuitively, if you have uh, one, one D, right? So you have like a magnet band, which has la larger density of states at the edge of the band. So you will have very asymmetric band. So this is a intuitive guidance. So, like so interestingly actually we see here magnetic excitations which uh, because we I, I wonder what will be there if we go into this thing uh, okay so here it's all kind of I just wanted to uh, touch on this beautiful work which uh, we're thinking how we can actually get spin liquid uh, from uh, fluctuations of charge and all this theoretical work was uh, pushed by this particular uh, spin liquid candidate, where people saw that there is some ferroelectric response there, right? And so there is a very nice idea that uh, there is with quantum dipole spin liquid, spin liquid which is a hot of, I think, formulated the name. And there is also a lot of work from uh, Nakwa and Ishihara on it, where we have we have dip electric dipoles on this uh, as one half lattice sites and uh, the fluctuations would be originally from electric dipoles and but because every dipole is associated with the spin then we'll have spin fluctuations and that's where we get this uh, non-ordered state. So uh, I kind of here is something which I really want to touch on because and I'm like really looking for feedback because this was something which starts like I thought that everything is clear for this material and then because of this ferroelectric response. And there was this paper which bothered me a lot, which was from Professor Yakushi in Kyoto University for like more than 100, than 10 years ago, where they looked at this charge sensitive mode for this material and then claimed that they see the dependence on cooling rate. So uh, if they really cool down slow, that's what the paper claims that they see the charge sensitive uh, this new two mode which is narrow and if they cool down fast they have an increase 
of uh, widths, uh, basically around the uh, intensity, uh, sorry, around the temperature where uh, uh, ferroelectric responses uh, observed. And this is why I was constantly asking if you see any cooling rate dependence. So I thought, okay, maybe we will cool fast, we will somehow modulate it. So uh, actually, when we looked very attentively on that, we see that these kind of two ways are done with two different, like with different crystals. So the first thing I thought, okay, this will be actually a very elegant way to uh, kind of basically to control uh, dipole fluctuations or charge fluctuations on site of these molecules, of, of these materials. And so we tried it and we didn't get anything. So uh, kind of we tried different cooling rates and this is the spread, which I think is also uh, this, there were a few samples and there's also, I think, few uh, different fits and there is, uh, depending on the intensity, there is some error bar in the fits, which kind of we have to look at. So it looks like we don't have any cooling rate dependence. However, we definitely see that there is this charge degree of freedom, which we characterize by the width of the charge sensitive band. Uh, appears uh, where we see ferroelectric response. So this uh, kind of charge dipoles on this lattice sites in these materials, apparently they are here. The width is though much kind of, I started to think when I prepare, started to prepare the talk that to avoid any speculations, we will have to start map these various diagrams just to the width of this charge sensitive band because there in principle could be disorder could be fluctuation. There are no structural disorder because we look at other uh, vibrations which are all the same. So anyways, this is a big increase, but it's less than in other copper phases where charge response is more uh, pronounced. Okay, so uh, what we actually, so what we are now trying to do, we're trying to apply straight to, strain to this system. And uh, so we are developing strain, it's not easy. And the first things we started to do just to apply the strain from uh, the sample, basically from the sample holder, right? Because uh, we know that uh, organic conductors contract really a lot. And depending on the sample holder, copper, titanium, what you can use, you can, the, the contraction is much less. So at low temperatures, you can strain, the kind of stretch it, and you can do, it, this was actually 2D. You can also do 1D depending how you, kind of unit actual strain, depending how you do the system. And it looks like we managed, uh, so with this particular strain, which is, this is the end, this is low temperature values, which is applied by the, just gluing to the titanium sample holder. We uh, shifted uh, this kind of charge sensitive band, so broaden it. So uh, what I uh, kind of, and that's what I think and uh, that uh, kind of we, Martin already kind of had some work that uh, charge order in copper phase can be suppressed by pressure. I think that strain could be also a good control parameter. And in this material, I think uh, we will be applying more strain to try to induce more of the charge order. It also kind of, this is like I'm addressing the community. I was always wondering if, Kind of a little bit different results on what we get from this material actually come from the fact how the sample hold is glued, or kind of this crystal is glued to the sample holder. And if this small amounts of strain will actually kind of a little bit change uh, the charge degree of freedom and then somehow affect this kind of spins. And how do they expect spin? So we can look actually, uh -huh. yeah. Yeah, this is this. 
yeah this is essential so we are just like started to do that and uh kind of we did uh, so we started at uh, first with the microscope where we can see on the charge sensitive band now we go to macro setup where we can see the whole spectrum uh of course macro setup like the basically the probe is larger we also were doing mapping to see if we have some local strain so we will do that we can look at phonons uh, so I think that lattice phonons uh, will be the answer of what we actually uh, kind of are changing in this system. There is also one interesting uh, in mode which is coupled to electrons, which is coupled to the jump between the dimers, which is also changing a lot. And I think it should, so this is something which we, we have to calculate. So I think it's coupled, it's a, one of these molecular vibrations which is coupled to the charge transfer between the dimers. So this will be the way to probe the uh, overlap integral between the dimers. And it's actually changing even more dramatically than this one. So I think, yeah, I hope that we'll be able to do that. It's a lot of work. So, uh, so these materials are uh, kind of also, and uh, I think, yeah, so Meha was talking about them. So these are also, we change a little bit the anion layer, right? So, and we also have copper phase on triangular lattice. Uh, so we have dimers. We have smaller integral, overlap integral within the dimers. So dimerization is a little bit smaller. And this, as we saw, uh, is kind of dramatically influences what happens with the charge here. So uh, the these are, calculations of uh, transfer integrals within the dimers. And so this was our spin liquid, this copper cyanide one. And compared to what's going on in this material, this is like a perfect single narrow band of the charge centers of vibrations. And uh, this uh, well, mercury chloride, I will call it, we have a metal insulated transition, which is at 30 K, which is associated with a uh, um, charge order and so we see this very robust to two very robust bands for the charge order charge order is small 0 0.2 uh, electron so uh, what we looked we actually were looking at what happens with the spins and magnetic excitations are gone and this is something which I haven't yet resolved uh, uh, kind of because as we will show we see some response uh, in susceptibility. So uh, what we know from calculations, deep to calculations, which are done by Ben Paulo's group that of course charge order renormalizes uh, all the magnetic interactions, right? It's also, we see uh, in principle, it's a dimensional crossover because we see now uh, charge ordered uh, stripes. Yeah, and uh, we don't see kind of there is no interactions or much lower interaction between the stripes. So uh, it could be that all the spin interactions are much lower and just our, we kind of haven't seen them yet. So there should be another effort to go to uh, lower frequencies to try to measure kind of uh, lower intensities to try to find it. Uh, so. Uh, yeah, so then there, and then basically there is space in between, which is uh, is occupied by the material where the mercury bromine, where the anion layer is a little bit changed, where we think that we see uh, dipole fluctuations. Why we started to think about it first, because we saw that this charge sensitive band uh, in, decreased in uh, width, but then increased as we crossed into uh, insulating state at around 100 K. So when we yeah, so uh, yeah so when we looked at the spectrum of excitations, we saw that it's not that kind of this is for comparison the um, copper cyanide. We saw that there is something at lower frequencies, and indeed, so at lower frequencies now I compare all these materials. So at lower frequencies, we see this beautiful collective mode, which uh, appears as we start to develop these charge fluctuations. And uh, so basically kind of the success was when the frequency of this mode was basically the same as the frequency of estimated of kind of uh, uh, fluctuations of dipoles on this side. And so 
that's why we decided that it's a dynamic process and that uh, the frequency of fluctuations which we estimated from this position is uh, the 40 wave numbers, 3.3, uh, 1.3 terahertz. Uh, so we start basically to build a kind of a phase diagram of this copper phase materials where the control parameter would be the overlap integral within the dimer. And uh, this is something to kind of, it, already look like there should be phase border between whatever happens here and the spheroelectric state. And uh, here we see uh, fluctuations of charge order. Uh, so I, I just wanted to look uh, exact kind of uh, again at this collective mode, which develops in the insulating state and it even tries to shift a little bit down and we will go back to it. So. Uh, Okay, let's keep that and let's uh, increase. Uh, how much time I have? Probably not much. Almost done. Yeah, that's what. That's that's what my suspicion. Okay, so uh, what we actually is interested uh, to look how this uh, kind of we understand what's going on with the charge pretty well. <clears throat> so the question is, how does it uh, controls magnetic properties? And uh, so we know a lot about this material. And then we looked at these two. And here we saw some kind of things which uh, are difficult to understand. And I hope that I will have time to talk about them and what we think about them. So this was, this is magnetic susceptibility of this, let's call it uh, dipole liquid, which was increasing basically in a way as if it was a ferromagnetic behavior, which is very strange for these materials where kind of no ferromagnetic interactions can actually be expected. These materials, and I will talk about this first, and then this first showed also something interesting and not just uh, ordering. So let's first focus on uh, this kind of on this uh, dipole liquid. And uh, well, we, so well, we did some measurements of susceptibility and also magnetic torque, which kind of I don't, we can discuss later if somebody is interested uh, in ISSP. While we were doing that, Martin also published a paper where the, the so these kind of behaviors somehow weaker uh, pre presented and thought that this is spin glass. And so the question is, if it's basically for this material now, this is dynamic and static, right? So if it's a dipole fluctuations or it's all glassy behavior. Uh, so, so far, we could not see any uh, anything which would suggest a glassy behavior. So we didn't see any hysteresis in magnetization. Uh, we didn't see uh, basically any very, very weak uh, difference between field cooling and zero field cooling. So, but no hysteresis, no, nothing glossy has appeared so far. Uh, yeah, so, uh, in Professor Kanoda group, there are now interesting results on NMR, which also suggests that uh, there is uh, some kind of variable time scales. However, what we realized that we cannot still, we cannot uh, understand. Okay, so let's go here first. So we see that this rise of magnetic susceptibility goes together actually with the rise of the uh, charge fluctuation. So if you see it, look at the temperature dependence, which has much less points of this of broadening of this charge sensitive mode and of the rise of the collective mode at low frequencies, it follows the same temperature behavior as uh, magnetic rise of magnetic susceptibility. So we indeed, whatever happens here with this charge fluctuation, they induce this behavior. Uh, we could not even though we don't think it's spin uh, glass, we couldn't explain it without uh, kind of suggesting that there was some inhomogeneity in the system. And Chizu Hata uh, suggested a very nice uh, uh, way of explaining it, where we have some charge uh, ordered, uh, charge, charge fluctuating chains, and then we have some dimers which don't have this kind of dipole on them. And basically the spin, which the spins on the ends of the chains, where there are spins on the end of the chain, they feel each other through the spin on this dimer. And this is antiferromagnetic and this is antiferromagnetic. Eventually we 
uh, see kind of dynamic ferromagnetic fluctuations. Uh, so uh, I have to say that uh, we have now some very new data from uh, EPR, which does suggest that there is inhomogeneities in the system. However, we think that, so basically this system is somehow a mix of inhomogeneities and uh, fluctuations. So, uh, yeah, so basically that's what, how we think about it now. So we kind of think that there are some charts. So we are, if this material, we are close to the uh, uh, border with a phase transition into ferroelectric state. And that's what is an origin of charge fluctuations in this system. But in addition, because of all this uh, difference degrees of freedom and maybe also lo some tiny local strains because the compounds are very sensitive to strains, we have some inhomogeneous behavior. So uh, the other material, this material actually doesn't stay charge ordered, but it is. this is again charge sensitive band. So charge order starts to melt as we cool down. Uh, so we, we actually get into some very broad and homogeneous charge bands. So there are definitely uh, kind of, uh, there is definitely should be some disorder or very low frequency fluctuations. Uh, so we don't, because it's a local probe, we cannot get exactly the result if the, it's basically stripes. Uh, Kind of still stay there, or there are some kind of random shaped domain. We, but we think that they're uh, kind of this um, low frequency phase of this material consists of something which is charge ordered, so it's fluctuating, and then something where uh, charge separation of dipoles within this dimers are very small. So we basically have to kind of draw here a random transition. And so the next question is, so what would happen with the magnetism here? And uh, it's interesting that it looks like in this material it actually shows that uh, the charge and uh, spin degrees of freedom are uh, coupled. So if they kind of, we again, will leave the magnetic susceptible, oh, sorry, the torque measurements out, but torque measurements show that there is no order at the, down to 100 millikelvin. Uh, so what we see in the susceptibility that we kind of, this is a place where charge is ordering and we don't see much of the like very tiny change here, but we see that the susceptibility drops at 24K. So this would be actually very typical for 1D material where materials where charge order is at much higher frequencies, temperatures than magnetic antiferromagnetic order or uh, spin porous transition. So basically it does in this very small temperature range, we can think about this system and did like a spin S1 half spin chain, which then wants to kind of undergo some transition. But when kind of any, the, we don't get to uh, zero of magnetic susceptibility because the system starts to, the charge order starts to melt. And then the charge order starts to melt, the susceptibility goes up again. So, and eventually, uh, kind of everybody agreed at this point uh, that there is no uh, magnetic order down to low temperatures. However, there are some spins in the system. So, uh, basically, I think that kind of our results in this part of phase diagram show that. Uh, magnetic uh, degree and charge degree of freedom and these materials are coupled in somehow uh, not very simple way, but uh, magnetic properties here are definitely defined by the charge properties. This is a nice theoretical work, uh, which somehow suggests how it all can happen. The uh, Naka and Ishihara long ago calculated this phase diagram actually, and uh, regarded for this copper phase, a competition between uh, magnetic and magnetic order, basically spin and charge degree of freedom. And they even suggested that at low temperatures uh, for this charge order phase, we'll have a uh, re-entry transition because somehow it's basically this, the system starts to care more about spins than about charge, I would say. They also predict a collective charge mode for this uh, region, which is uh, close to the 
uh, phase transition into the charge order state due to, of course, charge fluctuations. Okay, so yeah, so I think that we start to place things on the such a phase diagram where the uh, intradimer uh, transfer integral is a tuning parameter. And there are some, uh, this work actually from Martin's group, uh, that pressure would be a way to uh, suppress uh, charge order here. And we actually, again, kind of, I have to leave it out. We have recent result that strain actually can bring this material into charge order if you strain at the kind of right axis. Uh, so, uh, and yeah, so we now have to proceed with that. So thank you for your attention.